Hello, everyone. Let me begin by thanking Alice and Philip. It's an honour and a privilege to be invited to give a keynote talk at this event, and I look forward very much to hearing everyone else's papers. At this point, let me share my screen. Inspired by our host institution, the University of Vienna, I've chosen for my topic today, translating the Vienna Circle. I've been working in recent years on various aspects of the philosophy of translation and the translation of philosophical texts, focusing mainly on the continental philosophical tradition. So when I was invited to speak at this conference, I thought it would be a good opportunity to consider instead a different tradition which has long fascinated me, but which has been surprisingly neglected by translation theory. The Wiener Kreis, or Vienna Circle, were a group of philosophers and physicists, logicians, mathematicians, and social scientists, who held regular meetings at the University of Vienna over the period 1924-1936, under the leadership of the professor of natural philosophy, Moritz Schlick. Aside from Schlick, leading figures included Rudolf Carnap, Kurt Gödel, Hans Hahn, and Otto Neurath. Ludwig Wittgenstein had close links to the circle, and they were heavily influenced by his Tractatus, which they read carefully through together twice, but he was not technically a member. Ditto Karl Popper. Foreign visitors welcomed to join the discussions when they were in Vienna included A.J. Eyre, Willard van Orman Quine, Frank P. Ramsey, and Alfred Tarski. Credit for this graphic, by the way, goes to Karl Siegmund, although I hasten to add that there were also three women in the Vienna Circle's core group. Given that the core group, together with the peripheral visitors and occasional collaborators, numbered around three dozen, it's not surprising that the circle held quite a range of positions on some key philosophical questions. But they did publish a manifesto in 1929, which asserted their collective opposition to metaphysics and their unequivocal commitment to a wissenschaftliche Weltauffassung, or scientific conception of the world, based on logical empirical analysis, a verificationist theory of meaning, and a belief in the unity of science. <clears throat> in 1930, Carnap and Hans Reichenbach took over the editorship of the journal Annalen der Philosophie und Philosophischen Kritik and rechristened it Erkenntnis, Knowledge, which then became the house journal of the circle for a decade till it ceased publication during the war. Throughout the 1930s, members of the circle departed for exile with the rise of the Nazis in Germany, and meetings of the circle came to an abrupt end in 1936, when Schlick was murdered by a deranged former student although individual figures continued to promote its philosophical ideals, largely abroad and in English, under the banner of logical positivism or logical empiricism. Now, it seems to me that the Vienna Circle is of interest to translation studies for two principal reasons. First, it was a German language philosophical movement that had a major impact on the development of English language analytic philosophy. So it serves as a case study in the translation of philosophical thought, even if, as we'll see, the process of translating the Vienna Circle was less reliant on actual published translations than might have been expected. Second, the Vienna Circle took a keen interest in translation from a philosophical point of view, since it held that language is ultimately vitiated by metaphysics so that its members explored a wide variety of alternatives to natural language, seeking ways to translate experience more directly through alternative systems of representation, notably symbolic logic and pictorial language. I'll come on to the second point later on, but let's start by looking at the ways in which Vienna Circle philosophy was received, translated into English. If you're familiar with Wittgenstein's reception in English, then you'll know that it was facilitated by the early publication of his two key works, the Tractatus Logico Philosophicus and Philosophical Investigations in German-English bilingual editions. The fate of the Vienna Circle's publication was very different from this, and many of the key texts appeared in English only well after the war. Extraordinarily, 
The Circle's 1929 manifesto was first published in English translation as late as 1973. And even then, it was in abridged form, shorn of its extensive bibliography. Another key Vienna Circle paper, Otto Neurath's Protokollsätze, Protocol Sentences, 1932, first appeared in English only in 1959 in A.J. Ayer's influential OUP anthology, Logical Positivism, which was notable for including no fewer than eight first English translations of German language papers by the leading members of the circle, Carnap, Neurath, and Schlick, that had originally appeared over a quarter century earlier in the early 1930s in the first volumes of Erkenntnis. If it took so long for the work of the Vienna Circle to be translated into English, how did it come to have such an influence? I have four explanations to offer you. First, there were some English translations appearing at the time. For example, Carnap's 1934 masterpiece, Logische Syntax der Sprache, was already out in English translation by 1937 as The Logical Syntax of Language, translated by the colorful British translator, Amity Countess von Zeppelin. Carnap was getting translated into English in the 1930s because he was already being appreciated in the English speaking countries as the leading figure among the Vienna circle. And that in turn was because he was already lecturing and publishing in English himself. A second reason why the Vienna Circle was being appreciated in the English-speaking world then was that key members were traveling or emigrating and switching to English as their language of philosophical expression. Carnap's English was good enough for him to give three lectures in London in 1934, and these were published the following year as Philosophy and Logical Syntax. 1935 was also the year in which Carnap emigrated to the United States, and by 1936 he was already installed as Professor of Philosophy at the University of Chicago, publishing prolifically in English for the rest of his life. Even though Schlick stayed in Vienna till his untimely demise, he had married an American and spoke fluent English, so was perfectly capable of expressing himself philosophically in the language too. His Gesammelte Aufsätze switched seamlessly to English with the essay The Future of Philosophy, which he gave as a lecture to the Seventh International Congress of Philosophy in Oxford in 1930. In 1931-32, he spent several months as a visiting professor at Stanford. Then he lectured again in the UK at King's College London in 1932. So Vienna Circle members were having their work translated into English, to a limited extent, and publishing in English themselves. A third factor in the reception of the NSO court in the English-speaking world was the role played by advocates such as Susan Stebbing, the first woman professor of philosophy in England, who acted as an important bridgehead for the circle thinking. Stebbing was on the same panel as Schlick in Oxford in 1930. She lectured on logical positivism and analysis to the British Academy in 1933 and invited Carnap to London in 1934. The most important early popularizer come proselytizer for the Vienna Circle in the English speaking world, though, was undoubtedly A.J. Eyre with his 1936 study, Language, Truth and Logic, which was effectively a potted introduction to the movement. Air cites Carnap multiple times in the book. Also referenced are fellow circle members Hans Hahn, Bela Juhos, Karl Menger, Otto Neurath, Karl Popper, Moritz Schlick, and Friedrich Weismann. Where he can, Air cites English language articles and books, but the great majority of the Vienna Circle references are necessarily to German language materials, and he doesn't shy away from including them even in a popular introduction. A fourth reason then to account for the reception of Vienna Circle philosophy in English is that it was being read in the original German and there was no perceived need for translations. The widespread reference to German language sources in Ayer's Language, Truth and Logic reminds us of his own facility with German. After all, he had made a pilgrimage to Vienna and attended circle gatherings between December 1932 and April 1933. But what's more surprising is that it makes plain an expectation that his intended non-specialist readership 
will also be able to make something of this demanding German language philosophical material. Such an assumption on Ayer's part is testament to the quite different ground rules which pertained before the Second World War, when the language of intellectual culture and debate in the social and natural sciences was German. In this context, then, it's hardly surprising that the groundbreaking articles in Erkenntnis were not translated into English, for the primary flow of translations was actually in the opposite direction. As late as 1960, the American philosopher Quine, another of the visitors to the Vienna Circle, who overlapped with Eyre in 1932-3, not only dedicated his word and object to Carnap, but also prefaced it with an untranslated and unreferenced German language epigraph from Otto Neurath, the point in his Protokollsetzer essay, where he uses the analogy that has since become famous as Neurath's boat. We are no longer familiar with the kind of centripetal, German-centric linguistic self-confidence that Vienna Circle philosophy evinces. And we should remember that even several of the regular members were not first language German speakers. The Vienna Circle was a kind of melting pot. Indeed, I would go so far as to argue that the Vienna Circle philosophy of the pre-diaspora period is relatively monolingual, that other languages don't get much of a look in. In the case of the classical languages, Greek and Latin, this is programmatic. The Vienna Circle were keen to make a clean break with millennia of metaphysical philosophy and had correspondingly little concern for the history of philosophy. As far as other modern languages are concerned, though, the Vienna Circle is equally indifferent and simply homogenizes them. The most comprehensive single volume selection of Vienna Circle writings in German, the 2006 Felix Meiner Verlag volume Wiener Kreis, edited by Michael Stolzner and Thomas Übel, includes 28 essays by eight authors across nearly 700 pages, and there's not a single quotation in any language other than German. Linguistically, this makes for a highly hermetic closed system when everyone is cited in German translation. Descartes, Leibniz and Locke, Mill and Dewey, Duin, Bergson and Poincaré, William James and Russell. On the one hand then, the Vienna Circle could be characterized as the last great German language school in philosophy. But on the other hand, for all their preoccupation with die Sprache, it's rare for the Vienna Circle to thematize the German language itself. For such a linguistically concerned group, the Vienna Circle was surprisingly unconcerned about the language of its own self-expression. One of the rare moments of self-awareness about the peculiarities of German occurs in Schlick's 1932 essay, Positivismus und Realismus, when he remarks, I'll quote, uh, Peter Heath's translation, the main principle of the positivist seems to run only the given is real. Anyone who takes pleasure in plays upon words could even make use of a peculiarity of the German language in order to lend this proposition the air of being a self-evident tautology by formulating it as es gibt nur das Gegebene, only the given exists. Although this is not a direct quotation, it's clearly but a thinly veiled attack on the German language metaphys metaphysician who served the Vienna Circle as their prime example of what Wittgenstein would later call the bewitchment of our intelligence by means of language, namely Martin Heidegger. The Vienna Circle had form in this respect and regularly treated Heidegger as an Aunt Sally. In Carnap's 1931 essay, The Elimination of Metaphysics Through Logical Analysis of Language, he devotes a section to critiquing metaphysical pseudo-statements, and Exhibit A is an extract from Heidegger's 1929 inaugural lecture, Was ist Metaphysik? What is Metaphysics? that culminates in the infamous statement, Das nichts selbst nichtet, the nothing itself annihilates, rendered more facetiously as the nothing noths. The Vienna Circle was very aware that Together with ancient Greek, German is the native language of the mystificatory metaphysical tradition, very aware of what Neurath termed the linguistic abuses to which the German language lends itself. 
lampooning the metaphysical excesses of Heideggerian German served only as a kind of displacement activity though, for Heidegger was merely an extreme case of the problem of language more generally. Nor did switching from German to English provide a solution. German was a particularly egregious example of the potential of natural language to harbor metaphysics, but ultimately all natural languages were at fault. In this respect, the Vienna Circle formed part of an Austro-German tradition of Sprachskepsis, or linguistic skepticism, which, which, went, which went back via Karl Kraus and Hugo von Hofmannsthal, at least as far as Nietzsche. To combat this kind of metaphysical prejudice, Vienna Circle thinkers, primarily Carnap and Neurath, explored a number of alternatives, ranging from artificial languages like Esperanto, and the ordinary language which would prove so attractive to post-war philosophical, but to post-war Oxford philosophy, to so-called protocol sentences, the languages of symbolic logic and mathematics, Neurath's pictorial language, Bildersprache, shown here, and Neurath and Carnap's physical language, physikalische Sprache. The kinds of reductive procedures the, the Vienna Circle espoused stripping down natural language, stripping away any possibility of metaphysical expression, resemble the basic English of Wittgenstein translator C.K. Ogden, which was designed from the ground up to avoid prohibited words like appearance and transcendence, so that it would not be possible to translate a metaphysical proposition into basic English. And translation is ultimately the key. The goal of the Vienna Circle's physicalist program of linguistic reductionism is to translate your way out of metaphysics. In light of the Vienna Circle's concern with translation and translatability, I'd like briefly in conclusion to consider the translatability of the Vienna Circle's own writings. Given their concern to eschew metaphysics with a simplified style, you would be forgiven for expecting their works to be exceptionally straightforward to translate. And there are certainly, they are certainly easier to translate than Heidegger, but that's not saying much. Clearly, the passages of pictorial language in Neurath need precious little translating, and passages of symbolic logic in Karnap need none at all. Specimen ordinary language statements of the kind, and I take an example here essentially at random, there is a green leaf lying on my desk in Schlick, or I ate bacon and eggs for breakfast this morning in air, present few problems to the translator. But the thing is that such materials actually represent only a small percentage of the text of any Vienna Circle work. What's striking about the writings of the Vienna Circle especially given that they were mostly trained in mathematics and the natural sciences, is that they are very stylistically accomplished and highly readable pieces of German writing. Friedrich Weismann recounts that Schlick once remarked, we are all poets, Monke, wir sind alle verhinderte Dichter. And this is borne out by the linguistic and rhetorical consciousness evident in their writings, and not just in German either. If you're expecting dour scientific prose, then you're in for a surprise. And that in turn makes them more difficult to translate, at least as difficult as say, Russell or Wittgenstein. Theirs is a philosophical style which is relatively free of jargon, but in some respects, they can't avoid indulging in ambiguity and setting traps for the unwary. To give just a few examples, their manifesto professes their adoption of a wissenschaftlicher Weltauffassung, the latter term deliberately chosen to stress their distance from the Weltanschauung of traditional metaphysics. Yet this routinely gets translated as scientific worldview all the same. Following English translators of Wittgenstein, Sachverhalt in Vienna Circle's writing, in Vienna Circle writings, tends to get translated as state of affairs, although that's merely a convention and undoubtedly this is some of the nuances of the original. The key term Erleben gets translated as acquaintance. But as Herbert Feigl recalled, quote, Schlick was of the opinion that this term has no exact equivalent in English, close quote. And Peter Heath duly translates Schlick's 1926 paper Erleben, Erkennen, Metaphysik 
as experience, cognition, and metaphysics. As Oswald Hampling points out, even the keyword Satz, the standard German for sentence or a musical movement, becomes problematic when it's given a more technical air in English and translated as proposition. I hope to have demonstrated in this brief talk that the writings of the Vienna Circle make an interesting case study in the international reception of a school of philosophical thought through translations, but also by other means. In the latter part of the talk, I've also argued that they engage productively with the question of translation itself. And I'll conclude with the thought that it is surprising Vienna Circle thinking should have been so little explored within translation studies. With his 2016 book, Translation After Wittgenstein, Philip Wilson made a strong case for the relevance of Wittgenstein's thinking to translation studies. And I think it's high time that translation studies paid as much attention to the work of Wittgenstein's contemporaries and compatriots in the Vienna circle. Roman Jakobsen's 1959 article on linguistic aspects of translation introduced the term intersemiotic translation to designate the translation of a verbal sign into another nonverbal system of symbols. But he was only really describing after the fact what Carnap, Neurath, Schlick, and the others had been exploring a quarter century earlier. Every second Thursday at 6 p.m. in the Boitzmann Gasse at the Mathematics Institute of the University of Vienna. Thank you. <laughs>